It's time to finish up the Bloodlines crossover issue. I covered the backstory of how this came to be and some of the other books that were impacted last month along with the first two issues. This issue, I'm going to be covering Detective Comics Annual Number 6, Robin Annual Number 2, and Legend of the Dark Knight Annual Number 3. I'll be covering the teams behind this one as they come up issue by issue, since while we got some common people on individual books, otherwise they're pretty widespread. First off, we have Detective Comics Annual Number 6, with story by Chuck Dixon, pencils by Jim Ballant, inks by Gary Fernandez, colors by Adrian Roy, lettering with, by Tim Harkins, with assistance by Darren Vincenzo. We open with a drug gang going to kill some couriers who may have shorted them, only to be interrupted by Batman, and Batman 2, rather, uh, John Paul, wearing the gauntlets but not the Dark Knight armor, giving us an approximate place where we are in the timeline. One of the couriers tries to slip away, but the alien, Praetor, we got a name, feeds on the courier and then flies off. Afterwards, Bullock and Montoya take everybody into custody but miss the courier who was left in the bushes. When he comes to, we learn his name, Rodney Jones, just as he manifests his powers, elasticity. Going by the track record of the past few issues, you'd think that Rodney would be the protagonist of the issue. Instead, no. Our protagonist is Dwayne Guire, accountant at, Chem at company Chemax, and after a late night on in the office, as he leaves, he is also fed on by Pytor, and the feeding is slightly interrupted by a GCPD helicopter, which is then destroyed by the alien. Meanwhile, Batman is investigating the housing project that the gang who tried to kill Rodney was based out of. Said gang is called the Gangsta's Nine, a textbook example of a gang name invented by a white guy if I ever saw one. Batman arrives just as Rodney returns with his memory a little hazy. The head of the gang tries to kill Rodney again, only for his elasticity powers to allow him to shrug off the beating he receives, overpower his boss and his goons, and possibly kill his boss? It's, it's unclear. John Paul comes in after the fact and decides to let Rodney go. And that's it. Rodney never appears in a DC comic again. I can't find any sign of him. I've checked various DC-related wikis. Nothing. He doesn't decide to become a superhero. He doesn't even show up in No Man's Land in any capacity. Not as an antagonist. Not as a common citizen be trying with metahuman abilities, trying to step up and help his neighborhood and his neighbors in a tough time. Um, no casual mention. No we just random background appearance. Nothing. The character who comes out of this with superpowers and decides to become a superhero and appears in multiple issues after this is the white dude. I mean, kind of says a lot, doesn't it? Speaking of Dwayne, he comes to in an alley and discovers that he's invisible if he's in the light. He makes his way back home, throws together a rough superhero costume and the superhero name of Geist. Ta-da! I need a hokey name to go with this look. How about Geist, the Twilight Man? <sighs> You're losing it, Geyer. Grip on reality is going along with everything else. Other than the qualifications to be a world-class peeping Tom, what have I got here? I do wonder if the plan was to have Rodney be the main protagonist when it was initially per pitched, before getting vetoed in favor of Geist. Fortunately, Chuck's gone down the alt-right rabbit hole, signing on with Ted Beal, writing a QAnon comic in the 2000, in 2010s before it got before QAnon really got big, so that says something for when he went <laughs> when he lost it. Um and started going anti anti uh, when, when Comics Gate happened, um attacking women who were coming forward about their negative experiences, their legitimate negative experiences that they, that, um, with facing sexism and sexual harassment and sexual assault in the comics industry. So, yeah, I'm not going to be talking, contacting Chuck Dick, uh, Dixon for an interview to find out. Also, to be clear, I, like, We've covered him a bit before, but we can't talk about this period of Batman without talking about Dixon. I am well aware of his track record, as I mentioned earlier. 
And honestly, I have no interest in anything Dixon has put out more recently. I have a DC Universe subscription. That's how I'm reading this um, or have been reading this. And I don't know whether he's getting royalties from that or not. And if he's not, I, I'm not losing sleep. In fact, I'll probably sleep better. That day, Dwayne goes back to the office, barely manages to get his car keys back, and tapes a sign to the back of a coworker, mocking him behind his back. That night, Bullock, Montoya, and Kitch trace the killings to Chemax, where they have a run-in with Praetor. Bullock almost becomes a meal, but is saved by Batman 2. Meanwhile, Montoya gets some help from Geist, as the fight with Praetor sets the plant on fire, and in the middle of this fight, we learn that the aliens have Predator Vision, which... Considering Geist's powers, feels like cheating. Together, Geist and Batman 2 ultimately drive Praetor off with a little firepower assist from the GCPD. Next up, we have Robin Annual Number 2, with story by Chuck Dixon, pencils by Kieran Dreyer, inks by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, uh, Carlos Petrazzini, and Frank McLaughlin. And colors by Adrienne Roy, letters by Albert de Guzman, and, since we have editorial information, edited by Jordan B. Gorfinkel and the legendary Denny O'Neill. We start off with Robin falling off a building and giving a I bet you're wondering how I got here internal monologue. The story proper fits with the formula of the Bloodlines event so far. One of the aliens in disguise of a human, in this case a red-haired woman in a trench coat, lures a human into a back alley, in this case several cat-calling men, turns into a monster, and kills them to feed on their spinal fluids. And honestly, of all the people to get fed on so far, I have the least sympathy for these ones, given the context. We then go to Tim Drake, with him preparing for a night on the town as Robin, operating out of a condo his dad has in town. On the start of his patrol, he sees a group of what are basically Shadowrunners uh, breaking into Wayne Tower. Robin shows up to intervene, and the thieves who are in fact smarter than most characters in the Batman book, decide to immediately book it. Robin tries to stop them, but they parachute off the building, leaving some high-tech hacking kit behind. Once the team, the Cyber Rats, go to meet with their Mr. Johnson, empty-handed, they is, find he is very disappointed with the team's failure, particularly them having been hired to tap into Wayne Tech's satellite communications in order to get information on Project Echo. Remember that from, like, you know, before Nightfall actually started? Yeah, that. So Mr. Johnson, who is known as the Collector, and going from a, doing some wiki searching, apparently having previously appeared in a couple issues of Catwoman, decides to have his goons whack the team. Megabyte, one of the team members' street names, takes several bullets for the team leader, Razor. Hackrat, another of the team, uses their van to create a distraction so Razor and Channel can flee into a construction site where one of the aliens is lurking. The goons follow, forcing Razor and Channel to split up. Razor brings down two of the goons by shoving a stack of cinder blocks atop them. Two more goons find Channel, who, all three, who are attacked by the alien, or others say has been attacked by the alien, and those goons are attacked in turn. Razor finds all three and also gets attacked and fed on. We then return to the Drake's condo, where Tim is examining the Cyber Rat's custom gear. Back at the construction site, GCPD has arrived to survey the aftermath with Gordon, Sarah Essen, who is still using her maiden name, and Kish. We learn that GCPD is referring to the killings as the Spinal Tap Killer, Presumably, Gordon has not informed the rank and file that these killings are by an are by a killer of extraterrestrial origin, presumably to, uh, to avoid having this leak out in the public and leading to an ensuing panic due to Gotham starting to have metropolis problems. With some digging, Robin puts together the identities of the Cyber Rats and what their racket is, including some little bit of product placement for the North Face. At the Cyber Rats' lair, Razor regains consciousness after being out for two days, and after her and Channel being rescued by Hackrat. Both Razor and Channel have developed powers from the attack. Razor's arms can become blades, like the T-1000s, 
while Chandler's consciousness appears to have moved to the displays in the room. And during this reveal, as one would expect, Hackrat faints. Meanwhile, Robin goes after the Collector at the same time Razor is, though for different reasons. Razor wanting revenge, Collector and Robin want to take down the Collector because he's a superhero, that's his job. The two run into each other in mid-infiltration, but they skip the obligatory superhero misunderstanding fight thanks to an interruption from the Collector, who was having none of this BS. Ultimately, both reach the Collector, where Robin gets defenestrated, leading us back to the start of the issue. Razor leaps out of the window and catches Robin, and slows the descent to a safe landing with the use of, a para of her parachute and her blades. So that's right. Unlike the last few tie-ins, the Collector is still alive and ticking, and we don't have a, didn't even have a confrontation with the alien. Um, and also, we still don't know what Project Echo is. I did some checking. I don't think we, we ever do. We conclude our Bloodlines issues with Legend of the Dark Knight Annual number three. We have a story by the legendary Denny O'Neill with art by Mike Manley, Luke McDonnell, Greg Morrow, and Ricardo Villagran with colors by Digital Chameleon, lettering by Willie Schubert, and edited by Archie Goodwin and Bill Kaplan. We open with a hostage standoff as a man with a shotgun threatens three children while Priest tries to talk him down. We learn through the dialogue that the man with the gun and the priest knew each other when they were younger, and the man with the gun is expecting a ranger to come with the vehicle. However, the ranger is not coming, as he's been killed by one of the aliens. Now, while he is raiding, the man with the gun is giving a rant to spout off his ideology, which I would describe as edgelord atheism. That is, using atheism as a justification to be an edgelord. Nope, no decency. And you haven't either. Because there ain't any such thing, Padre. There ain't no Easter Bunny and no man from Mars either. Billy knows that. Don't you, Billy? Don't you know there ain't no man from Mars? No man from Mars, you say? Hurry, hurry, hurry! Faster, faster, faster! He's gaining! Kooky! However, this rant is interrupted by an alien attack and not by the Martian Manhunter, but rather yet another of the aliens from the Bloodlines crossover with the alien biting the Edgelord. The priest gets the kids to run away before trying to talk the alien down. It goes exactly as well as you'd expect, especially considering we've read five issues of, or we're on the fifth issue of this crossover so far. After the alien leaves, the two men, the gunman and the priest, eventually get up. The gunman, Haynes, and the priest, Father Hennison, are brothers, and we learn that their personalities appear to have flip-flopped, with Haynes having become remorseful and developed the power to heal, using it right out of the gate to save his brother's life. They walk back into town, where they just encounter a police officer, who goes to take the gunman into custody, except Father Hennison kills the cops, shooting one and draining the life force out of the other, before heading off, leaving the cop car behind. Haynes heals the cop who was drained, but the other is beyond his power to heal. Dennison, meanwhile, flags down a car and gets a ride back to Cotham from the proprietor of a costume shop. After he learns that she has a satanic priest costume in the back, he kills her and yoinks the costume, dubbing himself Cardinal Sin. New clothes. New life. I need a new name, too. Back in school, they said I wouldn't go far. Never be more than a humble shepherd tending a humble flock. Look at me in a cardinal's robe. So, I'm a cardinal. Cardinal what? Cardinal Sin. Yes, yes, lovely. Cardinal Sin. As someone who was raised Catholic, I can say confidently, without any hesitation or having to double check, that this is not what cardinal wears at all also they're called vestments not robes maybe the fact that they said that you'd never be anything more than a humble shepherd is more because you weren't paying attention in class 
The cop drops Haynes off at a bus terminal where a kid spots him and gets his mom to call the cops. Back in Gotham, Jean-Paul, now in the Dark Angel armor, is roughing up a subject suspect to an excessive degree before turning him over to Bullock, who exposits on Danes and Henderson, just as the call comes in. Bullock and Batman, separately, go to investigate. Haynes runs into a couple of cops at the terminal. When he doesn't resist arrest, the cops get all pissed, and because all Gotham cops are bastards, the cops go to kill him anyway in the terminal in cold blood, only for Asbat to show up. The cops decide that they want to try and take a shot at Asbat, not having gotten the mayor's memo, and are very quickly taken down. However, more cops are there, accompanied by Bullock. They also go for Asbat, and Bullock just sits back and watches as Batman easily cleans house. There is a fan theory that Harvey Bullock is a cop who pretends to be dirty to get the confidence of dirty cops so we can tip off Gordon. If this theory is accurate, I, and if assuming that this is a Bullock who is not himself fully clean, he's okay with other methods, I could see Bull Bullock, if he's got a big enough number of people to take care of, and particularly seeing where things are going with the mayor, finding out what cops would rough up Batman for not letting them kill a suspect in custody, and you're seeing as Bat, it's creating a situation to put them all up against them, or at least a bunch of them, just to take them off the streets and in the hospital. At Gotham Cathedral, Cardinal Sin kills the church priest as he prepares to go after the, the bishop. I suspect they mean archbishop, as I'm pretty sure Gotham could be an archdiocese, but again, this could be one of those cases of the writers clearly making, know that, making known that they don't know much about Catholicism. At the Bat Cave, Jean Paul removes Haynes' blindfold. He takes him to the cave, and we get some conversation about how Cardinalson's powers work and what his goals are before Jean Paul collapses from some injuries with, from his fight with the cops. Haynes heals Batman, and they go to save the bishop and take down Cardinal Sin. Long story short, the Archbishop is spectacularly dense when ignoring the fact of how Father Hennison has now taken on a supervillain name and costume. I mean, come on, this is the DC universe. Even if we operate from the perspective that Batman is an urban legend that barely anyone knows about him, there's still Batman's rogues gallery, which is public knowledge, um, and there's Superman, who just recently died and has multiple pretenders very publicly fighting over who will succeed him for the mantle, and the Flash, and all of their rogues galleries. So... He let, in any case, the Archbishop lets Cardinal Sin get close, and the Cardinal starts to drain him. Fortunately, interrupting Batman, doing the usual skylight entry, knocks Cardinal Sin away before he can do too much harm, and Haynes is able to heal the damage. Sin then goes to Batman, but Haynes grapples with his brother, and their powers feed back on each other, burning the both of them out. Afterwards, Batman talks with Bullock. Haynes is in a coma, and Sin is free, since only two people saw Sin use his powers and lived, and one of them is in a coma, but Sin's powers no longer work. He is absolutely powerless and is once again just a normal human being. I'm going to say this is the weak this is the weakest part of the Bloodlines tie-ins. This last issue, Ranger uh, Razor, Geist, and Ballistic all felt like characters that at this point Marvel would have done something with, even if any planned faults solo books failed. Razor and the Cyber Rats would be recurring characters in the Spider-Man office. Geist would probably end up in the New Warriors, or maybe a later iteration of the Defenders. Ballistic would end up in X-Factor, because that's how he because that's how they roll. Maybe even team up with Heroes for Hire every now and then. But Haynes and Cardinal Sin are very much feel like characters that Denny O'Neill had one story in mind for, and once he was done, he closed the door behind them. And um Uh, as far as um, our other character, um, Joe Public, how would he fit? Eh. He's the other one where he's a, he's a, a really weak addition, I would say, because his power is he draws power, life force from other people, and uses that to, to beef himself up, which honestly 
doesn't work out well outside of a team book, and inside a team book, it almost makes him a liability. Next month, though, Bloodlines is done. So it is time to begin Night Quest with the first installment of The Search. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 